Um, when uh, I, when I was in high school, there's no there was nothing further than being a teacher um, was on my mind. I did not want to be a teacher at all. I couldn't wait to get out of school. But when I was in tenth grade, I um, in my Spanish class with Mr. Mr. Pelk, Senor Pelk's Spanish class. He had a guest speaker come in who was a former student at, my, at our school who had been in the Peace Corps. And her um, presentation to our class was really inspiring. And I always had that in the back of my head. Oh, Peace Corps, that sounds like something that might be kind of cool. So I kept that in mind. And then I went to college and studied communications, still moving on a path of no teaching. And, but then I remembered Peace Corps and I said, you know, I'm going to try that. So I um, applied to the Peace Corps, got into the Peace Corps after a few interviews, and they sent me to Honduras in Central America. I was pretty naive at the time. I wasn't really savvy in, in the, the world of politics. But I did know that our um, Peace Corps um, branch or division in Honduras was the largest in all the world. I think largely because El Salvador was right there and they were going through civil war. Guatemala was going through a civil war. And then um, Nicaragua to the south was communist at the time. So we had all these countries in conflict and I think in order to mass U.S. military presence, they threw a bunch of young, you know, snotty-nosed kids into the country so we would sort of be the decoy for, I mean, obviously, I don't look like a soldier because I'm not in a uniform, but um, a lot of maybe other operatives, CIA and other people who I'm sure were all over the country could sort of blend in with all these other Americans who were all over the country. It was a little comforting to know that there were like, you know, a fellow Americans around to kind of protect you. I don't know, I mean, I don't know how if I would feel that same way today if I was there, I'd sort of feel duped. But that's kind of how I felt then a little bit. Um, and, you know, living in my, my little village, we would hear helicopters um, surveilling the area for escaped the El Salvadoran rebels, I can't remember their name, but they would, they would try to sneak into the country to escape what was going on in El Salvador. And, you know, the Hondurans didn't want them there, so they would be looking for them in the night and you could hear, you know, next morning you wake up like, why was there a helicopter flying over the village? They were looking for rebels. <laughs> rebels? Mm-hmm. You saw, you saw soldiers with big guns walk in the street and um, it wouldn't be unusual for your car to be stopped and, and you'd be uh, asked, they would ask for a bribe or they'll check that, you know, tail light that's out or something. I never drove a car, but the few occasions that I was in a car, things like that would happen. The whole car would be searched if you were going into the Peace Corps compound, the offices, you know, for bombs, because the, the year, the second year I was there, the Peace Corps office was bombed. The, the, the director's office was taken off the building. I think it was politically motivated. Um, we want, they wanted Americans out of the country. So, I mean, maybe there was something to be said for being naive at the time. <laughs> I was a little less scared because there, you know, there were, it, I mean, it was a dangerous place. Uh, I worked with women's groups and um, helped them set up better business practices in these tiny little businesses they all had. It was, you know, one village and there wasn't a village for f 10 miles anywhere around. And they didn't have cars, they had nowhere to transport to anyone else, so those 10 miles were really far away. Um, and, y you know, you'd go walk into this village and these women would, would greet me and they're like 70 year old women and they would bring me into their dirt their dirt floor houses and give me the best china, their one set of china and offer me food and coffee and whatever they had and they're literally dirt poor. I, I just remember, you know, these elderly women who clearly had lived, seen so much of life, you know, deferring to me like, no, you clearly know what's best and you know, you know what we should be doing here because you have the experience and I'm thinking to myself, I'm 23 years old, I have no experience. I'm a knucklehead from Michigan, you know, and, but in their eyes, I had education and things that they didn't have. You know, so I just remember having these conversations with these women in my broken Spanish, like, no, you are so wise. You have these years of experience, you know, together, I have, you know, we can work together. I remember times, you know, it was always a big treat to meet up with other Americans that you've made friends with and um, training and get together for like a weekend on the beach or things like that. 
learning how to dance, merengue. <laughs> In there. I mean, every weekend that's what they do. They go and they have merengue dances, even if it's just in the schoolhouse. But everyone just goes and dance, and like the women are very, like, no expression on their face. But their their bodies are doing stuff. You'd think that, like, they sort of like they remove themselves. Like they're just so fluid, but their faces are so blank. I always was amazed by that. Just culturally, it seems so different from the way you know Americans do things. And the men would would. Um, would drink this horrible stuff called guaro, which is like, it's really strong grain alcohol. And it was just amazing to see the transformations to such lovely, compassionate, sweet men. And I, and I specify men, because women, it was cultural taboo for women to drink, it was men. They would turn into really ugly characters. I remember that a lot. Like just drooling, like on the floor, drunkards just over one night. I mean, it wasn't often, but you would see that from time to time. That was unsettling. And um, living in my community, the kids would follow me around all the time. They would just, they thought I was the coolest thing next to sliced bread. They would ask me all the time if I had brain cancer because I had blonde hair. They would just correct my Spanish all the time and they were my really my best friends. I kind of got a good sense of Honduran culture from them because they weren't, you know, trying to put on airs for the American girl who was living in our town. They would just, you know, they would show, the, um, they were in charge of like, for example, um, uh, collecting the water and the good drinking water um, well was quite a ways and they'd have to walk down there and I would walk with them and in this walk to get water, they would just kind of tell me, you know, what's going on in their house and what's for dinner and, you know, what their dad is planting out in the field. And so I would just get a better sense of what was really happening in the community I was living in, um, as opposed to, you know, a lot of polite nods like, oh, hello, American girl, how are you? You know, from the adults. I remember um, sitting in the back porch of my house, it was about sunset, it was about six o'clock, and all the kids, I mean, they were like from age four to 12 for the kids who hung out with me sitting on the back porch watching the sunset and it was really flat you could see a great distance and just loving talking to them and I said this is what I want to do with my life I want to hang out with kids and just learn from them and have them learn from me and just spend time with them and that silly little moment is probably what inspired me to be a teacher